B team wants to start recording whenever that happens. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, everyone, I think we're already being recorded and starting for the day. So good morning. This is the second lecture. My screen says the meeting is going to be recorded. Something going on with the mic? I've turned it on. It seems okay. It seems to be amplifying pretty well. Can you hear me? I want to be able to speak in a normal voice. And it should be amplified. Good. Okay, I'm going to pick up where I left off yesterday, continuing these foundational lectures on viral ecology. And I know I did a little bit of a rush at the end, only a tiny bit of a rush, but I want to pick up from where I left yesterday in part because I've been told that I'm supposed to give some exam. And then I ask you what you do in the afternoons, and you say you study for the exam. So I want to give some example of what I might want to ask on an exam. And I even, maybe I don't know if today or tomorrow, you have an exam this afternoon, right? Exactly. Yeah. And just before I begin, because I want to get a sense of what I want to do later in the week, there doesn't seem to be a laboratory component. How many of you can code autonomously? Like you can open up your computer and start programming, right? Almost everyone, which means that even if some of you are, don't feel as comfortable, you can probably work in pairs, right? And how many of you work in Python, for example? Most of you work in Python, OK. Uh, any R or MATLAB? Eh, one or two. Okay, so it's mostly a pipe, which means that I will talk about that maybe tomorrow. Instead of having a normal lecture Friday, I'm strongly considering turning around the classroom and giving some assignments that we could work on in an hour and a half period to let you actually implement some of the ideas that we've been building. And that might be more productive or interesting than me continuing to tell you stuff and you being a bit passive. So I will decide. We might have a discussion of that tomorrow. Okay. So where I left off the other day was the following. We had a model in which we have these uninfected cells that can become infected because virus particles inject the genetic material into the host. And then these infected cells obviously can lyse at some rate eta, producing plus beta new viruses. And this interaction has some absorption rate, psi, phi, phi, not psi, phi, not psi, phi, just phi. And all of these can be washed out at some rate, omega, omega, omega. And this reproduces at some rate r. Okay, I just want to make sure everyone is on the same page that R is a growth rate. And you could think of this as even having some negative feedback because there's this carrying capacity. There's a washout rate. Because remember, there's a chemostat and everything is flowing out. We have an adsorption rate, a few more, lysis rate, and beta is burst size. Now I realize that since you're probably preoccupied with your exam for this afternoon, you may not read a, something that I were to share, but I will share one of the introductory chapters from my book that just talks broadly, what is a virus? You know, where are we here in this space? What are some typical traits? Give you a little bit more background. And I'll post that as a PDF. It should be a light read onto the Slack channel. I don't really use Slack typically because I already can, can only imagine how many emails I already get. So I can't take 50 new notifications. Here I am. I'm here for the next nine days. So if you see me, you can ask me a question at a coffee break. Right? And if you have an ur urgent question, you can always send me an email. Right? But I will share something that gives you a sense of scales and units. And just to have a little pause here, things like burst size, we often think about 50 right? or 100, something like that, meaning that's how many new virus particles come out, and it's a dimensionless number. 
this washout rate may be something on the order depending of 1 over 10 hours, depending on if slow, or maybe 1 over 2 hours if you're running a fast chemostat that you're really turning it over quickly, or it could even be slower. The carrying capacity could be something like 10 to the 8th per mil, or even 10 to the 9th per mil, right? So it could be a large number. This growth rate could be something like 1 over hour, or even 2 over hour, or even a higher number depending on how fast things are replicating. Obviously, it can be much slower. This lysis rate is often similar. Maybe it's something like 2 per hour. And this could be some weird parameter like 10 to the 7th, and I have to remember my units, milliliters per hour. Okay, so these are the sort of parameters that we need to make any of this stuff work so that our output ends up being something reasonable that we might observe, like a dynamics in which there's something like 10 to the 5th or 10 to the 6th microbes and something like 10 to the 7th viruses, again, in the units of per milliliter. I don't expect you all to memorize these numbers, right? But just like when you work in a physics domain, there are some key constants, and, and often there are very few, and you'll realize that when you start to work in biology, there are many, but you're going to have to have some intuition for them if you're going to operate, right? Okay, so I just wanted to review this a little bit to orient ourselves because you know, some of the questions yesterday, which are good, and I encourage more, and sometimes I'll ask you questions, and, and don't be afraid. Some place call that the Socratic method. I'm not trying to call people on, you know, on the hot seat. I just am trying to ask to make sure we have a dialogue, right? I'm not worried if you don't know the answer to that question. I'm also not worried if you speculate in your answer. That's fine. It's just a dialogue. We're having a conversation. This is the structure of the dynamical system that I wrote there. Right? The fact that I have three compartments. Notes the fact that there are three variables. Each one of these arrows, I have to have a corresponding rate in my equations. And if they enter one place, there should be one minus and one plus, going in and going out. Right? We're just moving flow around. And sometimes it gets magnified here by this factor. The host has spotlighted your video for everyone. Okay, great, thank you. It's been spotlighted. Okay, so once we establish this, the other thing I want to keep in mind for an exam is that you should be able to do a procedure. One, which is you should be able to check or find fixed points. And I went over that yesterday, okay? And what I'm going to do now is just to remind us and just make sure that this is clear. Was there a question there in the middle? No, it's okay. To find the fixed points in which all of these state variables, their rates are set equal to zero. And in this case, when I ask this question, what life history traits enable viral invasion and persistent with their microbial hosts, I'm implying that there already was a fixed point that was virus free. So first of all, here, there's a disease-free, actually, I should be even more careful. There's a sterile media fixed point. What is the value of the state variables if I have just prepared my media? There's nothing in it. There should be three numbers, all zeros. That's a fixed point. But that's not the one I'm interested in because if I add viruses to that, they won't persist. So in fact, if I were to do a stability analysis here, I should find a direction in which the system would relax. A perturbation would not grow in magnitude, and that is if I add more viruses. Or in fact, if I add more infected hosts in the absence of anything else because they would produce viruses, there would be nothing for them to grow on, and then they would wash out. So it's not as if just because there can be viral invasion, if I don't have the right ingredients, I need the disease-free equilibrium. This is just bacteria. And reading off there, you can see it is something like K wiggle zero zero, and I don't want to have to keep writing K 1 minus omega over r, so that's what I mean by k-wiggle. It is slightly less than the carrying capacity because of this washout term. It also says 
that for this to be true, my growth rate must be greater than my washout rate. If it were not, then the bacteria would be dividing, but they'd be going out more frequently than they'd be dividing, and my bacteria would not persist in my chemostat. Right, so I can't set my chemostat washout rate too fast. Right? So if the growth rate is like 1 or 2, I can't set this anywhere near 1 or 2 because then the bacteria won't persist. Okay? Now, when I'm asking this question, what viral life history rates enable viral invasion and persistence, what I'm asking is what happens if I went K wiggle 0 comma epsilon. I added a small number of virus particles. What would happen, given this dynamical system, n dot, i dot, v dot, and where would we go? Okay. And what I'm trying to make a claim here is that one of the options is I might, no, I didn't want to go there, I might go back up there. I might end up here, back with the disease-free equilibrium, even though I added virus. Or I might get to a point where I have n star, i star, v star, where I have a persistent infection that's sustained in this chemostat. And that's the sort of example I have there, where actually the dynamics, and I have to be careful here, because it could go to an equilibrium, or there's nothing to say, that it can't be some n of t, i of t, V of t, and I, you can think of this as an appropriate time average, that there may be a steady state rather than convergent to a fixed point equilibrium. Okay, so I could end up in a place where there's coexistence because it's coexistence at a stable fixed point, or maybe because there's some oscillatory or limit cycle-like behavior. Okay? This procedure of finding fixed points, first identifying them, and potentially even doing some linear stability work should be accessible. And I want to point out, though, this is a three-dimensional system, and that's kind of annoying. It would be nice to look just at the infected subsystem. And so I just want to point out here that when we're doing this linear stability analysis, in some sense, it turns out that what we're assuming is that n is like n star. We're not worried about the change in that host density at the start when we're looking at this small perturbation. And so, in fact, this is really a system in which I can think of it in terms of i dot v dot and just looking at that component of the system and assuming n is fixed. I get the fact that I should treat the full three-dimensional system and do my Jacobian and 3D, etc., but it looks operationally like the following which if you can see now I have phi n star v minus eta i minus omega i beta eta i minus phi n star v minus omega v. This little two by two system is our infected subsystem. And in fact, as far as I can tell, it already looks linearized. Right? Because it's just a product now, all this N star stuff has gone away. And so I could go through, the, turn the crank and calculate in this system the eigenvalues and find the condition in which the one is positive. If one is positive, I'm going to go here. If all are negative, I'll go back there. Okay. But I don't want to do that today. I've already, I'll let you all do that on your own time because it's laborious and, and a little bit algebraic and annoying. I just want to point out again what I finished up with yesterday, the intuition, that the viruses invade when one virus or an infected cell produce greater than one virus or infected cell 
in their life cycle. Okay? Yes? One virus or infected cell invade when? Better? The IT people didn't, haven't told me I turned off the whole machine by doing that, so I think it's okay. Yeah, I was told not to go too low. I don't even know why I'm going right to left, but I'm starting near the board and I'm moving away from it rather than getting closer to the board. Okay, so I just want to reiterate again these cycles because this is a point that I will share a paper that explains this in laborious detail and really goes through all the details, which I'm giving you the highlights right now and should give you enough of the intuition in a good sense. If I have... This is me sketching out some bad capsid. Okay, capsid, virus particle. Its life cycle involves injecting genetic material into a host cell. But remember, there's this alternative that it might be washed out. This happens at a rate omega. This happens at a rate phi. K wiggle, right? Because we have absorption to these cells that have a particular density. Right, larger. Yes. Right, larger. My drawings or the uh, Greek symbols? Everything. If I do this, that will help remind me. Better? Good. Virus particle, not drawn to size anymore, much bigger than host cell. It should be much smaller, but it's okay. Absorbs to host cell because there are a lot of host cells around, and you can see that this competition between these processes depends on how well, the hosts are doing in the chemostat. So if you wash them out too quickly, don't get enough nutrients, this number will go down, and then this route will be favored. If it gets in, again, it could be washed out. Again, a rate omega. It can also lyse with a rate eta. Producing... I can't draw them that big. I'm not even drawing them correctly anymore. That one is just a little house. <laughs> I was really one of the worst. When I was in elementary school, I got like the worst. I can't even draw within a line straight. Plus beta of these virus particles. Okay? We start with a virus particle, not a giant one, but you get the idea. And this is its life history so that by the end we're back to virus particles. We've completed a life cycle. Are there more of these than this? Because it could be on average we don't even get one. We get half of one. Obviously it doesn't mean we get half a virus. It means sometimes we get zero and sometimes we get two. Maybe rarely we get three. How do we figure out the productivity here? Well, this should be phi K tilde over phi K tilde plus omega. This is the probability of infection before washout. Do you even get in? And this is true for all those viruses. Obviously, you don't just add one. You add a relatively small number, but still, this is true for all of them. If you do then what's the chance that infected cell lyses? Well, that is just eta over eta plus omega. And if it lyses, it produces beta on average. And I claim, 
which you can explore, that if you were to look at this system and find the condition for one of the eigenvalues to be positive, you will see that this whole thing, and let me put the bait on the other side just to make it easier. should be greater than 1. And to make a connection with tomorrow, I'll just sort of foreshadow this, that this result is equivalent to saying something like r naught greater than 1. Has everyone been following this pandemic? Have you heard about r naught before? Which I will go in and explain more tomorrow in a microscopic context, and then next week I will hit it again from the epidemiological context. This is called the basic reproduction number in epidemics. It says the average number of new infections caused by a single infectious individual, now we're talking about humans, in an otherwise susceptible population. It is a threshold criteria. I will revisit it next week. I'm also going to revisit it tomorrow. You can use this same concept, and it's effectively the average number of new virus particles caused by a single virus particle at the disease-free equilibrium. It turns out that you can also use this concept to ask a life cycle question starting with an infected cell. If instead of adding epsilon here, I put my epsilon there, I could ask the same question and say, what is the average number of new infected cells caused by a single infectious cell in an otherwise susceptible population? I get the same threshold criteria. Okay? And this probably suggests why I didn't need to rush this at the end of yesterday's lecture. There was a lot more to say. This then helps to answer this checkpoint question. Which traits enable invasion? All of those that drive this up. Higher birth size, higher absorption rate, faster lysis, keeping in mind that it's all environmentally dependent. And I will elaborate on that tomorrow. I'm not going to get into all that today, but I'll elaborate on tomorrow. So it says that just because you're a virus with all these good traits, if the environment is bad for your host, you as a parasite of that host, an obligate intracellular parasite, may not necessarily make it. Okay? Good. If I do this for the next 65 slides, we will have a very long week. So I should move on unless there are questions. Yes? Is it uh, possible to do that to find that? I mean, this threshold, I guess, is a, 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 a static uh, threshold. Is it possible to uh, determine a, a threshold which, which depends on time? Threshold depends on time, right. So this is a threshold criteria that is true. It's independent of time because I'm assuming that in that time in which I'm doing my linearization or essentially assuming that the viral impacts remain small, because they remain small, the host essentially is relatively constant. Now, it could be that the host itself is going through some dynamics, so maybe that's what you mean, even before I add the viruses. Often then, there is a way to do a time average of the invasion over that orbit, and the appropriate time average can be used to make an equivalent kind of condition. And I don't know if that was the question you were going to ask. And there's, if you want to read more about that, you can look up something called Floquet theory. And that's nice, and I'm not going to talk about that today, but that's cool. So you can look into the ways in which you might think about invasion in a time-varying system that's still disease-free. But maybe you meant, what happens to this value as time changes? And in that case, you'll notice I can't say K wiggle anymore. And in fact, this basic reproduction number becomes an effective reproduction number. And the cool thing is if I want to look for where the equilibrium is, the equilibrium should be for a time invariant system. Here, obviously, there's a limit cycle. That on average, I can't make more than one because the thing would take off. I can't make less than one. So in fact, this goes to a system where my effective reproduction number gets close to one. And I think it's probably what you were also thinking about. Yep? I don't understand very well uh, the drawing there. Uh, what is the range between 
N's turn into I's at a rate 5V. Right? And in fact, V's go away at a rate phi n. And if I think of it as a per capita, obviously the combined rate is phi n v, so I have to think about them both as density dependent rates. I put the phi as a placeholder because it's really the total rate is phi n v, per capita on either side is different. And also the identity function of the yeah. This k, what I'm trying to say is that this reproduction rate is not just n dot equals r n, that, but there's a carrying capacity which limits that growth rate. It's, uh, I was using sort of a shorthand to say that this is self-limiting. I could have done something where, that's what I was trying to imply, that the growth rate itself is limited by its density and the parameter that limits it. It's not a rate anymore, it's just a parameter. Maybe I'll go like that just to remind you it's not a rate, but there's some limitation and that's the carrying capacity. Whereas before, I had this explicit resources, here I'm making it implicit. Other questions? And this would be a sort of a foundation, simple enough model that contains enough of the pieces that would be a good thing for you all to know. And whether we do this on Friday computationally, but certainly it could be the, the exam itself can't have computation on it, but there could be some questions about this kind of structure. Okay, and hopefully accessible questions. Any more questions about this? Good. I'm going to move on. Last call. Yes, here we go. Last one. This is. I'm happy to talk about this for a while. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. That's right. Because should I be repeating the questions for the folks? Yes, I forgot about that. Yeah. Okay. okay Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, what I don't understand is at point C, uh, you say that it's now the, subs the system is infected because you put the epsilon, right? Okay. Correct. But what I don't understand is when you write the equations, epsilon doesn't appear. So. The epsilon is just some initial condition for this small perturbation. So if we, were to, if we were to think about this, this is saying that our V0 is equal to epsilon. And our I0 is equal to epsilon. It doesn't appear anywhere here because this is a dynamical system equation. It would be appear because the value of V when you're doing your dynamics would be epsilon. I'm just saying, I was trying to note the fact that it's small. That's all I'm trying to say there. Okay, and then second question is, uh, you say that this set of uh, initial conditions, they can evolve to either uh, the, the set with the stars or the, the perfect one with just the k-tilt or the dependent uh, in time. So it will be different, and, but they obey the same equation. I don't really get... Uh, let me try to answer the question. I think you want to know the conditions by which we avoid the exactly. loss of the viruses and what differentiates these two outcomes. Okay. So the first thing that I'm focusing on is just whether or not we avoid the viral extinction. And maybe that's good or bad. It could be bad depending on your perspective on these viruses. But when this number is greater than 1, then one of these two outcomes will take place. I haven't said which one. When it's less than one, this criteria, then we'll go back to this, criteria, to this condition. So the viruses will wash out. Now, which of these happens depends on other parameters that I haven't talked about that could lead to oscillations in a stable limit cycle or to convergence to a fixed point. And I don't have time to go through the details of that other condition. So I'm only telling you whether the viruses invade, and yet there is a half bifurcation which allows an oscillatory solution to emerge, which depends on another set of criteria. It's more technical and not that intuitive to understand, at least not in this format. But nonetheless, you are right to point out that I haven't told you which of those two outcomes happens. You are correct. I've just told you which class, whether it goes away or it persists. 
But in the set of equations right here, you introduced n star. No, the, on the right, the i and v. Correct. Yeah. I introduce n star to remind you that invasion has a biological environmental context. So it depends on how many hosts are available. Keeping in mind that the host, this n star, is the disease-free equilibrium value of the bacteria, which is equal to the carrying capacity modulated a little bit by the relative growth rate um, and the washout rate. So if you were, for example, to simulate this, initially you would plug in this value, or if you were to calculate the Jacobian, you have to evaluate it at a fixed point. V and I are all small. They're already implicitly small. This is fixed. So you'd have your constants in your Jacobian. You calculate your eigenvalues. And my claim is that you would end up getting a threshold criteria where the, one of the eigenvalues is greater than zero when that condition holds. But I have to provide some context. Right? Just when I evaluate a linearized and nonlinear system around a fixed point, I need a fixed point. So that's what I'm trying to say. The fixed point is with when there are no viruses around, and that one is unique. So that's why I can write n star there. Be uh, of size two? Correct. Okay. Correct. Which is also convenient. If I can say something, I think part of the question comes from the fact that on the right you use n star to indicate the fixed point with the virus. Ah, present. okay. Got it. Got it. And yeah. Okay. If, let me, is that better? Yes. Yes. I didn't realize, I was using in my mind that it, I can go for it. Yes, that's what I meant. Got it. Thank you, Jacopo. Okay, are we, now we really have last call. This is like popcorn popping, and I heard the last popcorn pop. So I'm going to move ahead. Okay. Let's see if my screen even remembers that I'm still there. With this very long <laughs> preface in mind, I want to go back to what I kind of rushed through at the end and unpack one of these experimental time series in which experimentalists Brendan Bohannon, Rich Lenski looked at the dynamics between phage T4 and E. coli B. So we have a bacteriophage that could obligately infect and then lice cells releasing new viruses over something like a week plus, right? about an eight-day or so experiment. And I, it would be nice, of course, to have even more data points, but each one of these data points takes a lot to do. Right? You have to measure the bacteria by looking maybe at cell counts and colonies in order to count the viruses. Then you also have to take them and then put them on bacterial lawns and count those plaques that I talked yesterday about, which are sort of the whole version, the inverse of the colonies. And you end up getting these large-scale oscillations, even though this is a chemostat. It's being provided constant input. There's no oscillatory input. There's no light, dark cycle, day, night, seasons. It's just everything the same. But nonetheless, we end up getting these very large-scale oscillations. Right? Two to three orders of magnitude in densities. Driven by the fact that viruses infect cells, driving them down, and then as they're down, You'll notice that these lines, I know it would be better to have more resolution, they look pretty parallel, right? Because at that point, the viruses are facing this dilemma. When this value of n, going back to your point about time, if the n gets very low here, no longer at the equilibrium, then this probability gets much less than 1, and you end up having largely the fates of these virus particles be that they're washed out before they ever find a cell. And because of that, they're effectively decaying exponentially at the washout rate of the chemostat. As they drop down, the host can recover. But as the hosts recover, now this is no longer the case. And they can start to find these host cells and lyse them, leading to a recovery. That cycle repeats again and again, which is cool, I think. Okay. 
So this is what I tried to get to the end of yesterday. And obviously, in the last three minutes, I had like a 30-minute sub-lecture in my mind, which I assume you all understood. Uh, but now you do. And that's fine, because I haven't prepared all five lectures yet. I wanted to see how things were going. And so I'm not going to try to accelerate to make up for whatever the 30 minutes I just did. I'd rather get through. I have some core material. We'll get through the core stuff this week. And whatever is extra, we won't get to. So these original models of virus-host interactions presuppose a simple relationship that's very much prey-or-prey-like. These viruses, which are parasites, and I'll elaborate on the parasitic nature more tomorrow or Thursday, lead to cyclical dynamics in which viral peaks follow host peaks, driving hosts down, uh, and then the viruses follow, leading to host recovery. And we get these counterclockwise Laca volterra like cycles. And as I tried to elaborate today, Invasion and persistence are not inevitable. They depend on properties of the host context. Okay? So conditions that don't necessarily favor the host are also going to disfavor viral invasion. Okay. In all of this, if this wasn't already enough of a mess or fun, depending on your taste, I've made this very strong assumption that we have fixed properties. We have these two players, host and virus. But evolution can rapidly change the number and relative abundances of both the host and viral strains. And I'm going to try in this lecture to unpack it. I'll see how far I go and continue tomorrow. So this next part, I want to ask the question of how does evolutionary change alter virus-host dynamics? And do you usually take pictures of the board or no? We're just going to let it slide. It's recorded. Wonderful. Can I erase all this because I might need the board again? Or do some people want to take pictures of the board? These aren't any, this is just sort of, this wasn't what I expected to do. So there's no piece of paper that says that this is what was going to happen today. This is what happened. OK? Erase? Fine. Good. And I, and I even have a wet towel today. This is awesome. I like the wet towel. It makes this much easier. OK. Good, in case I need to go and do stuff. And Fabio, we'll get you a new wet towel for your lecture. This one is getting messier by the second. OK, so recall. I just told you, so it's not a long break. This was meant to be maybe the start of today. So here I am. I just told you that. I just told you that. But look, there's more. They continued the experiment. No, oh, they didn't just stop at eight hours, not eight days, excuse me. They kept going 600 hours, right? about three, were, three weeks plus of these experiments. And I think you should notice there's been a change in the dynamics. Now we have still the host in blue and the viruses in red. And I think it should be apparent that after about 200 hours or so, maybe about 10 days into this experiment, you see that the host flatline and the viruses start to oscillate. How can this be? How can this be? Say, say, it, say it loudly, and then I'll repeat. Uh, it's OK. Yeah, maybe I'll just repeat instead of you having to chase. Because then for the listeners online, that would be easier. Just go ahead. So maybe the infected cells are bursting in some different way over here? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah. If they were, it's curious, though, the hosts don't seem to mind. So yes, there is some bursting. Maybe that explains one of these virus bumps. So the question is, maybe the, vi the comment is maybe the hosts are bursting, there's some infected cells, but that it wouldn't explain the fact that the hosts don't seem to change in their abundances. Other, other comments? I'm just going to keep. Unpacking them. Yep. By the time we have selected some resistant cells. Maybe we've selected for some resistant cells. Could be. It makes it curious, though, that the viruses seem to be able to keep going up at various times. By the way, I may just be misdirecting you. Maybe all these answers are correct. So I'm just giving you a counter as my natural instinct. 
Any other comments? Or people are like, I don't want to do this. He's just going to tell me I'm wrong. Some of these are actually correct. So I'm just trying to, was there a comment here in the middle? On the chat. Uh, there's a chat comment. Let's hear what the so chat people say. Rainer said that the host achieved some kind of immunity after exposed to some of the mutated viruses. OK, so now we've already jumped to the mutated viruses. Maybe, and maybe there's immunity. And that's a different word than resistance. And we'll actually talk about that. Usually in these biological systems, we think about resistance meaning the inability, often, of a parasite to infect and lice, often from the outside, can't even get in. Or it could be resistant because it gets in and it's not effective. Immunity might imply something like this CRISPR-Cas mechanism that actually can identify the foreign invader specifically and even learn from it. I think that's often what we think about with an adaptive immune system. OK, and there's no evidence in this particular case, but it's a good suggestion that there might be that particular kind of adaptive immunity. I think that's enough ideas on the table. But I want to point out some features. What makes this curious is that the hosts look relatively stable. If I had stopped it right here, I think it would be fair to say that some resistance evolved and the viruses were going to be washed out. But they didn't. And the viruses can't replicate on their own. They need a host. They need a susceptible host. So clearly, there are still some susceptible hosts around. But yet also, there seems to be a problem. If these were all susceptible hosts, why isn't it doing the dynamic from before? Right? So there are cells that, in fact, are being infected in lice. And there are resistant cells. So neither one of you are we're both partially correct. There's actually a mix at this point. What had happened was there was a mutation to resistance. But somehow, not all of the cells are resistant. If they were, then this viral population might go extinct in the absence of a counter-resistance on the side of the virus. When they actually looked at the very end of the experiment, they realized there were different kinds of colonies. And so they realized that what had happened there was there were two different types, which they then isolated, marked. And instead of just counting the total number of bacteria, because when you count colonies, remember I told you what these colonies are, you take bacteria, you put them on an agar plate, dilute them down so that individual colonies, these little worlds of bacteria, are growing up from a single potential bacterium. And you can count how many bacteria there are by diluting it down until they're countable on the plate. They can't tell the difference between what's the characteristic of that particular bacteria or not. They're just counting colonies, but the colonies look different. So then they could pick those colonies, isolate them, grow them up, and realize that, in fact, there were resistant and susceptible bacteria in the same time in the chemostat. And instead of waiting for that to happen at random, they put the resistant kinds back in and realized and noted that they went to, relatively speaking, a flat line level, even as susceptible hosts remained in the chemostat. If you add up the solid and the open circles on a log scale, it looks like a flat line. Those oscillations are in the background noise of the resistant type. So resistance was there, but cells weren't being infected and lysed. And if you notice where the peaks are, the virus peaks are following the susceptible hosts just as they had been before. So now there's a different question. We've explained a little bit why we can get these cryptic dynamics, but we haven't necessarily explained why the susceptible hosts are sticking around. You have this pressure. You have washout to both. And yet somehow, resistant hosts, which aren't being lysed by viruses, are not excluding the presence of susceptible hosts. So how could that be? Why are the susceptible hosts sticking around? Why haven't the resistant hosts essentially eliminated them, and therefore the viruses should be totally wiped out? Any speculation? Yep? So it could be 
that this resistance susceptible property is some sort of phenotypic switching property. Maybe I'm just bouncing back and forth, and every time I replicate, I make more susceptible hosts, and that would just always keep things around. Okay, so that could be, and in fact, that kind of phenotypic switching does happen. Right, so that definitely does happen. There's other mechanisms. So that's one that could actually enable a coexistence between two types, right? Genetically the same, phenotypically different, and they would coexist. And maybe because they coexist, then they get driven by these other dynamics. That's possible. Any other suggestions? Let me, let me hear if I can hear from a few times, but let me hear if I one other, any other voice, and then I'll, I will turn to you in a second. Any other voices? I haven't heard from yet. Yes? Sorry, I just don't understand why they should exclude Okay, so we have a chemostat in which all the things are being washed out at rate omega. So e, from a perspective of who's in whose favor, neither one. Resistant hosts are not being killed by these viruses, which are, can rapidly eliminate these hosts. And so I have one host which is not being killed, one host that is, but the one that's being killed somehow is not being washed out. Yeah, but if there is no resistant host, there is still not washed out. So I don't know why. But now I have something that has a growth advantage over the other. Right, relatively speaking, these resistant hosts, remember because we have 1 minus n plus, we have r plus s over k, they're competing, and yet I have a growth rate that it has an advantage over you potentially, I'm kind of pointing towards an answer. They're in the same chemostat, right. But I'm kind of giving away the answer there in asking your question, so in an answering your question. So let me turn around and say, when can resistant hosts invade? Instead of saying, why, it's, why aren't susceptible hosts washed out? Let me even just ask the question, when can they invade? And give a little preview by thinking of the fact that it is not necessarily guaranteed that the resistance comes with no cost. I believe you had the no free lunch theorem. They've been learning about the no free lunch theorem in this course recently. You haven't been learning about it. Didn't you have a lecture by Wolpert? Ah, I didn't talk about no free lunch. OK. Do you get free lunches here? See, there's no free lunch. It even applies to ICTV. I don't get a free breakfast. You guys don't get free lunch. So you know, we're all in the same boat here. You can look that up later. It is neither here nor there with respect to my lecture today. But there could be a cost of this resistance. Okay? So if we think about how a virus might get in, and there may be some receptor on the outside, it is often the case that these receptors have some relevance beyond letting viruses in. If all they were doing were letting viruses in, they would have been removed by selection probably a long time ago. They might provide some structural integrity. They might allow for export of molecules. Or they might allow for the import of molecules, including things like sugars that the bacteria might need. So either by getting rid of them altogether all or reducing the density of those receptors, so some of there but less, this might change the properties of this bacteria with respect to the virus, but it could also come with some cost to this growth rate or maybe even the carrying capacity because the efficiency of uptake which is setting that carrying capacity has now changed. So it could be that the susceptible hosts have some property R and K, and the resistant hosts have some new properties. And I'm just going to change the growth rate for now, rather than both the growth rate and the carrying capacity. But I certainly could do that. Does everyone understand what I'm trying to say here? I'm trying to say that the life history traits of this resistant host need not be exactly the same as that of the original host. Right? There's evolution, and it doesn't just affect necessarily one trait. So. I would now like to introduce a different kind of model. And when I'm doing these, you'll probably both, there's some level which I, I was thinking back to my days as a physics student and when I got annoyed with my professors. 
And sometimes when they made a move that I felt was not totally formal and rigorous, I'm about to make such a move. Because now that I'm here, I realize that if I make the totally rigorous move, I can't do any of the things to get you the essential idea, and so I'm going to have to make a simplification. You recognize that when I started, I had these resources, and then I made a resource implicit. And yes, if you want to read about how I do it, how I can do that, and you can do it, it's in a book, and you can make a reasonable approximation. A moment ago, I had infected cells. I'm about to eliminate them, because it would take me so long to explain all that with the infected cells, and I lose the intuition. So now I want to make a model in which I have susceptible cells, viruses, and resistant cells. Yes? There is a question from the chat uh, about the assumption there. Why do both susceptible hosts and resistant hosts have the same carrying capacity? They don't have to, but I'm going to just do it for convenience as a way. So they certainly don't have to. In this particular example, I'm going to show you one consequence just by looking at a growth rate cost. There could also be an efficiency of uptake which could lead to a different carrying capacity. That question is totally correct. But I'm going to do one such assumption. If I want to build such a model, I would have some growth rate R. And I'm going to use my little bracketed K to remind you that it's not a rate, but it's just a limitation. And I'm going to have susceptible hosts being washed out. And I'm going to make even a simpler way of denoting the fact that there's some adsorption rate phi, and you realize what that means now. These can also be wiped out, washed out. And the resistant hosts just get to replicate, but at some different rate, R prime. And they get washed out. And I'm going to use my little k to remind me that they also are limited. OK? And I'm going to try to ask this question, when can the resistant hosts invade? Well, let me now try to write down this new system in which we have coupling between the susceptible host, the resistant host, and the viruses. I'm not going to worry right now for the infected cells. Yes? So the chemostat is just pulling everything out at the same rate. It could be in a, if this were a model of a marine system, or it's sort of what's going on in a bioreactor, or even in our gut, it may be that even the resistance has some cost upon the residence time or an intrinsic mortality rate, right? But because here I'm assuming most of this loss is just dominated by the chemostat, I'm going to assume it's the same. OK. So I can write this as following that we have some logistic growth that looks the same for susceptible and resistance hosts, except I've put a little prime there denoting the fact that there may be a different growth rate. And yet, the susceptible host can be infected and lysed by viruses, whereas the resistant hosts only get this extra washout term. The viruses infect cells, leading here because I've eliminated this latent period and made it assumed to be very small, immediately burst with a burst size beta. They also can get wiped out. Okay. So. We want to answer this question, when can resistant hosts invade? What would be the procedure? I just explained this a moment ago. Find these fixed points. Look potentially at whether or not the new type might then increase in abundance if it starts off at a very small value. So let me first of all 
point out that we have to think of not of the disease-free equilibrium, but the disease equilibrium. Right? We are starting not in the absence of the virus. The virus is there. So we have to find these fixed points. And here I'm going to rewrite this as beta tilde phi SV minus omega V, where beta tilde is just beta minus 1. Because it's just the discounted burst size. I have to have 1 to make my burst. And I'll just call that beta tilde. So you can see that our initial conditions should be S star equal to omega over beta tilde phi. And I should point out that this should be less than k tilde. The level of the susceptible host that the virus is drawn down should be less than that of the initial carrying capacity. Or the viruses couldn't have invaded. If the viruses needed more than the carrying capacity to invade, they couldn't have done so. So we can only have the viruses present if they have drawn down their resources, the host, to a level less than that set by the chemostat itself. I get some nods that that makes some logical sense. OK. Good. That's one point. Then we can look at this S dot equation to find the value for V star. And we can see that it should be something like R over phi, 1 minus omega over beta tilde phi k minus omega over phi. OK. I think that is right. Good. This is our initial condition. And we can ask the question, what is R dot? Well, we have R prime R. Yet initially, we can think about the limitation as not being caused, and I'll now put an approximation there, as caused by the impact and competition with other resistant hosts, because there are so few. It's caused by the presence of these susceptible hosts that are there. Minus omega r. And now, if I were to rewrite this in line, which I know is annoying because you have to write it twice, but I don't. If I write this again as just r prime is the original growth rate, 1 minus some cost. Right, so I just want to make the cost explicit. This r prime could be less than r because there's some cost, times this stuff. What you can see is we can take certain limits. Let's say that omega over beta tilde phi is much, much less than k tilde. Meaning this virus is really wiping out the host, drawing them down to very low levels. If that ratio is very small, right, then we get a limit where r dot is approximately equal to r1 minus cost minus omega r. In other words, as long as the host, the resistant host, can replicate faster than the washout rate, it could invade. OK? So when the virus, the more efficient the virus is, the cost of resistance can be very high, and yet in the resistant host can still make it. Let me just finish the thought so I can get to both sides of this, and then I'll take your question. Another limit could be that omega over beta tilde phi is nearly k. It's like less than, but nearly k. In other words, the viruses are only making a small dent in drawing down the host population. 
in which case this number gets to be very small. Right? And so if that becomes very small, then the only way we have r, 1 minus cos times some, let me call this something near to 0. I know this is a terrible notation. I don't want to use epsilon. I'll use epsilon again. I'm going to use epsilon whenever I want something to be small. Epsilon minus omega r. So here, a large cost is going to be deeply problematic. In fact, it might not even matter what the cost is because it may be even if there's no cost. Right? Now obviously, there has to, there, if there was no cost, it would be back to this. We'd have a zero in the limit. We'd have a zero invasion. But if there's any reasonable cost, then we're going to have this less than the growth rate. Because remember, at this point, the susceptible host has a net growth rate of zero. So this suggests that if I want to know when can hosts invade, it depends on the cost and how efficient the original virus is. Did you have a question? Because I'm assuming that at the beginning when resistant hosts are invading, they are a small population and R squared is very small. So I'm essentially linearizing it without linearizing. Question from the chat? Yes, uh, uh, it's a minus omega, not plus omega. Colin uh, realized that. Yeah, this is a minus. It just hit, it hit a parentheses. Minus. Yep. Yep, two questions. Make them loud so the people in the online can hear. The first one is uh, the first limit. Uh, that is k tilde or just k? k tilde. k tilde. OK. And uh, the other, could you repeat how did you find the initial conditions on S star and V star? These initial conditions are ones in which I am evaluating the emergence of resistance after I've reached the fixed point. But you are right that technically speaking, the question was, how do I choose these initial conditions? I've assumed I've already reached an effectively a stable point in the original system. Mutations could have risen before that. So if we were to actually do this as an experiment, or if we do this as a stochastic model representing the experiment, then the time when this resistant host emerge is not going to be the same every time. And you can see here also we have oscillation. So I'm using something in which it's a time average effectively. But you're right that in fact what I should be doing is evaluating over the whole cycle. But by illustrating this, I'm trying to show you what, is, what are the levers by which even resistant hosts can invade. And the levers are first of all how efficient viruses lice. The more efficient they are, the more the resistant can be costly. The less efficient they are, then less costly the resistant is permitted for that resistant host to invade. And obviously, if there's no cost to resistance, then we're going to get invasion. Because then we have two equivalent types, and one of them bears this extra cost. And essentially, then we have this selection of the resistant type over the septal, which has this extra additional burden. Any other questions? Yep. Actually, more like a mathematical question. How did we get the R dot equation? Because um, in the term in, the, in the parentheses, we got 1 minus omega divided by beta, beta tilde phi k. But that's uh, S plus R divided by K. I didn't get how we get from there to there considering the initial condition. On I'm interested that the beginning invasion implies the zero. population itself is near zero. Mm, okay. So I'm ignoring the R squared terms. OK, thank you. OK, so again, the point that I'm trying to make in this case is context matters. Before, for the viruses, it was the host context. Here, for the resistant host, it's actually something about the previous virus-host relationship that determines whether or not whatever the costs are involved with this resistance, are they permitted with respect to the ecological circumstance, and can that resistance take off? 
Okay. So now, in the next 20 minutes or so, and I'll stop a little early, my tendency is to go straight through, right to the end without a break. And then maybe I'll stop a little bit earlier today because I have a, a third part, but I think the third part will probably be tomorrow rather than today. There's going to be a lot to do today. It's my feeling. Okay? So, these ideas go back a long time to Lacan Volterra, but even in the late 70s, by studying these virus host systems, Bruce Levin, Lin Chow, Frank Stewart, together recognize that intrinsic feedback between this predator, this bacteriophage, this obliquilytic bacteriophage, and the susceptible host, the prey, could lead to cycling. For exactly the same reasons that Lacan and Voltaire identified these counterclockwise cycles. Right? Because not because there was outside pressure, but because of this nonlinear feedback could lead to oscillations in which you had this predator peak followed uh, by the host decline, and then the predator decline, host recovery, and the cycle again. And we get this loop in the prey-predator uh, prey phase plane. Bohannon and Lenski and others identified in the 90s something called cryptic cycles, where if you were to go out and either in a field setting where you're measuring things because you don't have a way to put them into culture back in your laboratory, you might measuring some hallmark gene, some feature that you think is associated with this type, you might see things like that, cryptic cycles. If you observe time series like this, there's a little dip there, but when you have measurement noise, you'd probably see a flat line oscillations. And I know some of you may be interested in things like Granger causality and inferring relationships from time series data. It's very hard to see a relationship if one is flat. Very hard to see that there's a fundamental relationship. These are called cryptic cycles. You can even get things like antiphase cycles, things that don't look at all like the canonical predator-prey cycles. You can't get those from the predator-prey system. There are a number of features you can't get, in, in part because you can imagine if it was a two-dimensional system, some antiphase cycle, cryptic cycle, goes back on itself in the phase plane, which is not obviously permitted. It implies there's an extra dimension. The extra dimension is provided by evolution, that there's, in fact, more than one type there. We're just looking at this three-dimensional system in the two-dimensional plane and realizing something is wrong. It turns out you can get even wackier stuff when both the prey and the predator evolve. And the wackier stuff is noted here, where if you see I've labeled the red and blue, and they're not incorrectly labeled, where the predator peak precedes the prey peak. In other words, the prey seem to do best when there are the most number of predators around. This is exactly the opposite. It implies clockwise cycles rather than counterclockwise cycles. So what I'm going to try to do today in the last bit here, and I won't even try to do part three, is explain this when I go from ecology to evolution to coevolution. Okay? Good. Here is a particular example of how I got that. And you should not go and try to write down all these systems of equations very quickly. First of all, I'm going to give you the slides. And second of all, you can get the gestalt just by looking at the diagram. We have two kinds of bacteria, two kinds of viruses. One of the bacteria is more susceptible to infection. One is more resistant. One of the phages is more virulent and able to infect at a higher rate and lice at a higher rate these cells. One is less able to do so. You can imagine then we could write down four systems of equations that have a growth rate, some infection, and some loss. If you were to then simulate it and looked at the total in the solid or the individual strains in the dashed, you can begin to see it's possible to construct examples in which the virus peak precedes that of the host peak. But I've shown the dashed lines to give you a sense that although if you looked at the total, you might see clockwise cycles, the reality is that it's underneath that is something else. And that 
something else are strain level changes in the frequency of the different kinds of genotypes, the host or the virus genotypes. Okay, so I want to unpack it. This is an example of such a situation in this phase plane where I have prey and predator, but now they're going around the clockwise way, the wrong way, right? Where we basically have a peak in predators, and it's the peak time in predators where the prey seem to take off. It's exactly the wrong thing from a lack of Volterra perspective. What I'm going to do is highlight four points. And I'm going to use the following kind of notation to provide an intuition. What I'm going to try to do is to use the blue bars. I can't, what are the color, blind colors? Or it's not blue red, I hope. It's, it, it's blue red, what is the color, what are color blind colors? Anyway, it's, the hosts are on the left. I, I think it's blue green, right? It's, it's, I don't think blue red is a color blind color. On the left are the hosts, and on the right are the viruses. The solid denotes the fraction of those hosts that have low vulnerability. In other words, are these resistant types. The open fraction denotes the fact that these are high vulnerability, easily infected in lice by the viruses. On the right side with the red, we have the solid being a low offense type, and the open being a high offense type that is more likely to infect in lice. Okay. So let's look, for example, at this peak point. We have the most viruses around, but they tend to be these low offense types. How can the prey take off? What is happening is as the total prey is going up, what's really going on is that they're shifting to a low vulnerability type at a time in which the viruses are dominated by low offense viruses so they can essentially escape that viral infection pressure. At the moment when the world is dominated by these high vulnerability types, it's exactly the right moment that viruses don't necessarily need to pay a cost for these high offense types, and the viruses are shifting to the low offense type just as the hosts are shifting to the low vulnerability types, and that explains why the prey can take off. But in a context in which we now have a lot of low vulnerability types, and we have a low number of viruses, there's a lot of hosts around, but to get them you better switch to the high offense types, and when I'm saying better switch, I'm anthropomorphizing what is happening autonomously, then there's a shift to the high offense viruses, but because there aren't many viruses around, a host that doesn't pay all that cost for being well defended will invade. So we get a high vulnerability type invading amongst the host just as the viruses start to switch and that leads to the, prey take, the predator taking off. And this cycle repeats the wrong way. Okay. These clockwise population dynamics, which you can't get from an evolutionary system alone, you actually need coevolution to get the system to go the clockwise direction. Letting that sink in. I spent a lot of time building up some of the foundations and then showing you examples both of these oscillatory dynamics and even things like cryptic cycles, so I now want to ask the question, are there actually clockwise cycles in phage bacteria data sets? This is an image of what a chemistat actually looks like. I know it's a little bit small. There's a sampling port, these vessels which are shaking. There's some line to a vacuum to pull everything out, that rate omega. And this is an interaction between a phage and Vibrio cholera. Vibrio cholera is bad, right? You don't want to get cholera. It can be infected by a phage. So that's interesting. People have been thinking about phage-based therapies for cholera. On the other hand, cholera's virulence genes are often moved and transported by phage. So it has a very interesting relationship for some other day. When they put this system into a chemostat, this was what the empirical data looked like. It's, again, about a 25, maybe three-plus week experiment, and it looks probably to you a bit like noise. One of the things that we noticed, and I guess this is one of the things that happens when you're in a field for a long enough time, you start to notice things that look like aberrations. 
And in the data itself, they had thought that the dynamics here would look like clockwise, counterclockwise block of Volterra-like cycles, but they didn't seem to. In fact, it seemed to be the fact that when the viruses peaked were precisely when you see these big jumps. The viruses seem to be abundant, and all of a sudden the hosts take off. So I want to focus on those two parts and take them into a phase plane and point out, I know that not much data here, but it's the data we have, and I'll do some statistics in a moment, that these things seem to go around in a clockwise way rather than a counterclockwise way. Now it turns out that in this way at all paper, they found that there was more than just this time series evidence, but there seemed to be when they looked at the size of these plaques. Remember the plaques I keep talking about? There were T for turbid plaques. They didn't look like they were doing that well. And B for big plaques, which seemed to be very efficient at lysing. So there seemed to be evidence of multiple genotypes. Likewise, there seemed to be already identified multiple levels of resistant hosts. So if things that were relatively not going to be infected by the turbid kind of producing virus and some things that seem to even be less likely to be infected by both. So it seemed to have all the right ingredients. I think you can probably raise a question of is this enough statistical evidence for concluding that this is a clockwise cycle rather than a counterclockwise cycle. So what we did is to take these time series, the full length, find the point-to-point -point variations and construct an ensemble of synthetic data sets that had the same point-to-point -point characteristics. So we're creating artificial time series, so there are time series, not just moving the points at random, we're taking the differences, adding them up, making a time series, and then in a cycle of that length, asking the question, what is the winding angle? Essentially, how much does this wind around in a short, si in a short period of time, and how close does it come back to where it started? This is the winding angle. This is the distance from where uh, the little orbit started. This would be an idealized clockwise cycle. And this is where the data sits. And this is where the ensemble sits, all these black points. I want to give you an example. We applied the same idea to the classic lynx hair data, like the data that is used canonically to demonstrate that Lock of Volterra-like dynamics have this counterclockwise cycle. And you can see that we have similar sort of support to the extent to which we can conclude that Lynx hair data is counterclockwise. We also are concluding that this virus host data is clockwise. OK? So we have some evidence here that there is, in fact, a very fundamental difference in the output of these interactions. OK. We also looked at a number of other studies with the same sort of method finding that there were other examples in which things seemed to go the wrong way in the phase plane. And for another day, if you're interested, there's a whole bunch of literature has come out showing that many of the cases that were supposedly, because we assumed they're predator prey and therefore there were lockable terror cycles, when we didn't find them, people tend to think, oh, the data was messy. In fact, there are many examples in which people have found antiphase dynamics, cryptic cycles, and even these clockwise cycles. So it turns out it's not just because you have a prey or prey system that you get inevitably this lock of Volterra-like dynamic that only applies, that only happens when there's not evolution taking place. But evolution is always taking place. So we often see exceptions. Okay. I'm going to now sum up what I've done in the first two lectures with this one picture. To the extent to which you take a system, or at least sum up parts of it, we expect there to be, in the absence of evolution, counterclockwise cycles. And I've given you the conditions even when there's invasion that could happen. Obviously, these cycles could spiral into a fixed point. When you have predator prey evolution, you get things like antiphase cycles, which things are going like this, and clockwise cycles, which I just showed you. And again, this should already point out we have this point in the phase plane in which there are two directions that it can go, that clearly can't happen if we have actually a two-dimensional system. It implies that we're taking this more complex system and projecting it down. So evolution can undo this counterclockwise cycle of Lock of Volterra, and coevolution can actually make it run the other way around. So I think I'm going to stop there. 
and conclude with these ideas that rapid change in the frequency of genotypes can have effects on ecological dynamics. We saw that in the Bohannon and Lenski experiment and I've also unpacked it when there's co-evolution that can have a fundamental change including leading to clockwise cycles and there are many other questions to ask but I won't ask them now. I can continue part three tomorrow. Uh, just to conclude before I wrap up, I know you have an exam today so I'm not going to post other than the slides, I won't post any reading, uh, but if you feel, actually tomorrow I'm going to post both some background material, light background material that you can read in advance if you want to, but it's not required, but I will post a more detailed thing tomorrow which will get you ready for Thursday. And tomorrow we can also have a discussion on what you all would like to get out of Friday. I'd almost be inclined to do something hands-on. I mean, I'll talk to you about that as well, which I think could be fun. Any other questions for today? Yes. Why a clockwise cycle is uh, so strange from a physical perspective? When people first started to see clockwise cycles, one of the earliest examples were people mislabeled data. And the question was asked, do hair eat links? Right? Because that's what it seems to imply. Right? Do bacteria eat phage? That's why it seems unusual. Because it seems at the moment when the predator is most abundant, the prey are delighted, taking off. So typically, this is not what one expects in a predator-prey system. And it takes appealing not just to evolution, but to coevolution or plasticity, different kinds of types. So going back to your question about whether or not this is a genotype effect or a phenotype effect, it actually could be plasticity or behavior change or phenotypic differences that could drive these same kinds of things. It's actually hard to tell the difference. Here I'm attributing it to coevolution, but that's why it seems so paradoxical. Okay, I think probably everyone needs a coffee break. So I will continue tomorrow picking up here in part three. Thank you very much, and good luck on your exam. Have fun with Fabio in about yes. 20 minutes or so. Yeah, so we'll be back at uh, 11 uh, with uh, the next lecture by Fabio Cecconi on chaos. Oh, did I start? Wait, I started. How far was I supposed to go to today? Well, in principle, to um, uh, 10.45. Oh, I can go for 20 more minutes? Yes. Ah, I thought, I thought it was 10.30. Uh -huh. <laughs> ah. A plot twist. <laughs> Wait, but maybe they want to take the time off now. Actually, you know what, fine. I'm going to stop now anyway. Now it's vacation. Now it's vacation, no, okay. Yeah, I, uh, it's very hard to, to pull oh, back. Oh, God, now. I forgot. I thought I was looking at the clock. I was like, I have to finish by 10.30. No, no, no. You have, uh, I don't know if you, have, if you want to give. It depends. I mean, if you. Ah, how are you all feeling? Do you, you were very excited that I was about to let you all go 15 minutes early. <laughs> Okay, you know what, then I, I can't undo that, because then it's very I, There is cruel. no coffee, so... The oh, there's no coffee now? Yeah, okay, no, fine. because it's not ready. Ah, interesting. <laughs> no, there is coffee, there is a coffee break, but, but it's in not uh, now. 20 minutes. Oh, my God, I got my time all mixed up. Am I online still? Can everyone see this? Oh, whoops. Well, uh, we can do two things. I could continue. I'll make it by popular vote. Well, I, usually, uh, in fact, this is supposed to be not a democracy, but I will turn it to a popular vote. We could have a discussion a little bit of what we want on Friday, or I can continue to part three. Who would like more stuff? I think they're already very tired. You would. No, I can tell they're very tired. Can we talk about Friday then? I'm going to give an extra 15 minutes, and, and it'll be fine. It'll be fine. This is actually, like, intellectually for me, I'm not going to be able to finish this, and we added up a lot of stuff here. So, on Friday, and for those of you who are listening online, I stopped 15 minutes early today, and whoops, that was just me misreading the clock. Um, we can do another lecture, or we can do a hands-on material in which you, I've built some laboratories, which usually take two and a half hours to run, but you can get them started, and then in some of your afternoon time, which my impression is free, you could continue them, in which they are presented as code bases that you begin to replicate some of these dynamics that I have elaborated here, meaning you actually start to build models and ask in sort of a question and answer set. There's a student version, I have the instructor version, and if you're willing to do that, it would mean that everyone has to come with a computer on Friday, 
And I realize for the folks at home, it's a little trickier. So I've talked about Yakubov about that. Does everyone have a computer with a Python preloaded on it? Yes. If anyone doesn't, there's enough people with yes. And I assume the folks at home, the answer can be yes. I won't be able to provide as much support for that, but I will go over the concepts. Has anyone ever done these kind of simulations before? Like two or three of you. So almost all of you, this would be a new experience. OK. Uh, online, is there a way for me to do a poll, a Slack poll later? Uh, yes, on Slack, yes. I think we can do it. Uh, OK, so I will yeah. talk to Matteo about doing a Slack poll yeah. and figuring out if maybe um, we can do that on Friday. I think there's some inclination. Would that be something you all would be interested in? And actually, some, a practicum. So I think we're going to, I will go in the direction of a practicum for Friday, which I will distribute. And we may even start that, and that can be something that you all can do if we don't get done, and revisit it in the next week. Okay? So even if we don't finish it, we can get it started and revisit it. Uh, Jacob, I'm sorry to say that I misread the time, and, and I've gone so much further with this derivation on the board that I'm, there's no way for me to start and finish part three. You all get 15 minutes in the Trias Sun, uh, and you have half an hour break instead of 15. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you.